Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today I bring you all a different sort of video, speaking about the five most powerful beings of good and those of evil in the Third Age. I hope this video sparks some thought-provoking conversations in the comments below, as while I'll be as objective as possible using different evidence to back up my assertions today, this is definitely a subjective topic, so let me know your thoughts. Also, these are in order, with the number ones of each list being the most powerful, going to the number five, which is the least powerful of the five. Before we begin, let me define how I am measuring power in this video. By power, I mean to say the essence, spiritual or otherwise, that allows a character to be one who changes the world, either by influence or conquest. I'll also speak to how they actually used their power, versus their power being theoretical or unused. Power most definitely takes shape differently in these characters, but hopefully my reasons concerning them make sense. Also, let me say outright that Tom Bombadil and Goldberry are not on this list, for while they are most certainly very powerful and did aid our heroes for the good of Middle-earth, they still remain rather neutral overall, at least more neutral than they could have been. For that same reason, no Valar are on this list either, for they did not do much in the Third Age of Middle-earth, even though they obviously were good. My friends, let us begin with the most powerful beings of good in Middle-earth. Number 5. Radagast the Brown We begin with an interesting and perhaps controversial choice in the brown wizard, Radagast. Again, based on my disclaimers of power at the beginning of this video, while his spirit is indeed technically more powerful than some others to come on this list, he did not necessarily and explicitly use too much power to aid the West in their fight against Sauron, and as we know, Maiar can even be slain. As it even may have been for Radagast, as he disappears from our story. Indeed, the Blue Wizards also could technically fit on this list for that same reason, but we have no idea what power they actually used to fight against the Dark Lord, if fight against him they did. But as for Radagast, he was the master of shapes and hues, and his friendship with the animals of Middle-earth, such as Gwaihir the Wind Lord, and the other eagles made him quite a helpful individual for the West. Certainly, since he was a Maya and did use his powers to aid nature against the Shadow, he deserves the number 5 slot. Number 4. Glorfindel Of course, Glorfindel deserves a spot on this list, for while he did many great and powerful deeds in the Elder Days, we must look at what he did in the Third Age explicitly, for that is our concern here today. Glorfindel, with his steed Asphaloth, saved the ring-bearer Frodo Baggins during the Lord of the Rings, and his nature as a High Elf helped in pushing the Nazgul into the ford of Bruinen. However, he would likely not be on this list if we considered only these actions. Rather, I also look at when he led the forces of elves alongside Elrond and King Aarner of Men in crushing the realm of the Witch King, Angmar in the north, at the end of the Angmar War. Glorfindel was the only one who understood the nature of the Witch King during this battle as well, knowing he would not fall by the hand of man. If Glorfindel had used more of his potential power in the Third Age, as he surely might have in aiding the White Council or in doing other non-explicit deeds. He may be considered more powerful on this list, but as it stands, he is number four. Number three, Elrond. Elrond most definitely deserves to be number three on this list, for while one may argue he was not the warrior Glorfindel was, or have the power that Radagast had, he had capabilities concerning leadership, wisdom, the knowledge of lore, healing, and much, much more to offer. What's more, he carried the Ring of Air, which had preeminence over the other Elven Rings. In protecting and ruling Rivendell throughout the Third Age, aiding in the fight against Angmar, and then being a most reliable ally to many heroes during the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, Elrond was quite powerful in a different way indeed. During The Hobbit, his knowledge of lore allowed him to identify the Swords of Gondolin, and his knowledge of moon runes allowed him to translate the Map of Thror. His friendship and renown reached far, allowing him to summon the Council of Elrond to decide the fate of the Ring, which he only did after having the power to heal Frodo of a Morgul wound, something that few others in the history of Middle-earth even had the power to do. And even before this, Elrond used his power to wash away the Nazgul in a flood in the Bruinen River, combining his power with that of Gandalf to accomplish this. In doing all of these things, Elrond is quite responsible for the adventures of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings happening as they did. He would also play a great role concerning the descendants of the kings in the north, and his urging that his daughter should only be married to the king of both Arnor and Gondor made such kingdoms rise in splendor under King Elisar. Elrond is certainly number three. Number two, Galadriel. Galadriel, the bearer of Nenya, the ring of water or adamant, the daughter of Finarfin, one of the last elves to have seen the light of the two trees of Valinor left in Middle-earth, 
and the Lady of Lothlorien most certainly deserves to be the second on this list. She had mighty power, for she protected her realm with her ring, and it is said that Lothlorien could have only fallen if Sauron himself came there, and certainly that was because of Galadriel. She had the strength of will to reject the One Ring when it was offered to her, and we know that if she did not have the will to forego the ring, as she did and diminish into the West, Middle-earth would have become her dominion. Throughout the earlier years of her life, she wanted her own realm to rule, and had such in the Third Age. And if she did not quell her ambition, Middle-earth itself might have been her realm. We see with the destruction of Dol Guldur that she had powers akin to those Luthien used on Tol and Gowerhoth, and she could have definitely wrought more havoc with her magic if she had the will to do so. She had also worked subtly, however, with examples being the mist that shrouded the Eothade from the eyes of Dol Guldur on their way to the field of Celebrant, her mirror that could see glimpses of potential futures, and her file that captured the light of Eärendil. Galadriel was very powerful indeed. Number one, Gandalf. Finally, for the faction of good, no one deserves the number one spot more than Gandalf, with emphasis on his time as Gandalf the White. While his former years as Gandalf the Grey were filled with many examples of his power, both concerning his powers as a Maya and wizard, especially when he slew a Balrog, and his wisdom and kindness also, Gandalf the White, who ousted Sauron from the White Council and Order of the Wizards, was indeed more explicitly powerful than Gandalf the Grey. What's more, both Gandalf the Grey and White bore the Ring of Fire, Narya, given to him by Círdan the Shipwright, and this ring allowed him to inspire courage in others, which is perhaps one of the most powerful things a person could do in Middle-earth. The West would have certainly fallen without him and his many alliances, and Gandalf was most definitely the most powerful character among the factions of good. With the five most powerful characters among the factions that stood for the good of the world in mind, let's now look at the most powerful five characters who sought to do evil in the world. Number five, Smaug. Smaug the dragon was the most powerful of his kind left in the world during the Third Age, and his actions broke two kingdoms, if only temporarily, those of Erebor and Dale. While a more agitated and active Smaug could have certainly wrecked havoc upon much of Middle-earth and would perhaps be higher on this list of power if he had been so evil, he was lazy and unmotivated after taking Erebor. He possessed a large size, mighty wings, nearly impeccable armor, and Breath of Fire, which would go on to destroy Lake Town ere he died from the Black Arrow of Bard the Bowman. While Smaug deserves to be on this list, and may have been more innately powerful than number four, which is to come, in some ways at least, he did not use much of his power after his most infamous deed, taking Erebor, landing him at number five. Number four, the Witch King of Angmar. The Lord of the Nine Nazgul, the greatest servant of Sauron, a sorcerer and warlord from Numenor, the bane of the North Kingdom of Arnor, the Witch King of Angmar showed on many occasions his great power. As implied by that last sentence, he also had many, many powers and capabilities, and accomplished great evil in his time. And some of the greatest examples of his power are how he used Angmar to crush Arnor, send spirits into the Barrow Downs, use incantations and mortal sorcery, and even stand up against Gandalf the White. The Witch King alone would have been a large and looming threat over Middle-earth in the Third Age, but there were yet others more powerful than him, and all three of them were Maiar. Number three, Durin's Bane. The Balrog of Moria, one of the last legacies of the depths of Morgoth's evil, was one of the most powerful evils in the Third Age, having taken the kingdom of khazad from the dwarves, which would have been nearly impossible for any other evil to do at the height of the dwarven civilization. Durin's Bane was also the reason for Gandalf the Grey's demise, meaning the power of this creature was nigh comparable to his, which makes sense, as Durin's Bane was also a Maya. Indeed, if the Balrog had gone forth from Moria, he would have been a terror upon Middle-earth. Number two, Saruman of Many Colors. Saruman, once called the White Wizard, who would have perhaps taken the number one slot on the list of powerful good beings if he had remained loyal to the West, was still one of the greatest malices in Middle-earth during the late Third Age. His Palantir gave him access to the Dark Lord directly. His fortress of Isengard and his Tower of Orthanc gave him a strategic place of incredible strength, and his position, Amaya, who was the head of the White Council and Order of the Astari or Wizards, meant that he was not only incredibly powerful, but also was deep in the councils of the factions of the West. He did study too deeply into the arts of the enemy, however, and he lost his way, 
and what's more, his pride was his undoing, for nature turned against him on two occasions. Once when he had imprisoned Gandalf, who had attempted to see the One Ring destroyed, and the Grey Wizard was saved by Gwaihir the Windlord. And the second was when the Ents of Fangorn turned Saruman's fortified position into a waste of water and stone. In the end, this once mighty and arrogant wizard was slain by one he considered to be a slave, Wormtongue, amidst those he considered too weak to be of notice, the hobbits. What he did with his power turned everything and everyone, even the Dark Lord Sauron himself, against him. Number one, the Dark Lord Sauron. Finally, unsurprisingly, Sauron is most definitely the most evil, powerful being in the Third Age. From his innate power as a Maya, having been the lieutenant of Melkor, knowing much about the powers of ringcraft and necromancy, and being one of the greatest influences over all things and people that opposed the good of the West, Sauron wielded immense power. Perhaps the best way to depict this is to say that Sauron, who was disembodied for most of the age, and when he did have a physical body was still weak, who only survived because of a ring he made in the previous age, which was either lost or in the hands of his enemies, was still the greatest threat to Middle-earth, despite all of this. The ring itself was almost too much for his enemies to overcome, let alone all of his armies and the strength of his realm Mordor. If he had been embodied and had the ring, the world would have fallen before him undoubtedly, thus making him the most powerful being of evil in the Third Age. From the stories of these powerful beings, we see that most power in and of itself is neither good nor evil. It's what one chooses to do with it that truly counts. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this different sort of lore video today. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on all of this, and what do your lists of most powerful good and evil characters in the Third Age look like? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks to our Valor Tier patrons, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Cal Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Matt Zabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Ben Gardner, Condar, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolik, Kuzan, Brandon Glidden, Molly Sullivan, Daniel Burns, and Anthony Harmon. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of our patrons and YouTube members. It really means a lot. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today, and I'll see you all again on Sunday with that video on Pippin. You all are the best, my friends. Thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.